welcome everybody to Comic-Con at Home. Uh, my name is Andrew Farrago. I am the curator of the Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. And you're in for a rare treat. This is one of the very few, maybe only face-to-face -face interviews that you're gonna see in the Comic-Con at Home <laughs> series. Uh, you know, I went above and beyond this time. I have, for the last four months, been living 24-7 with my interview subject, <laughs> Shane and Garrity, <laughs> for uh, our spotlight panel on Shane and Kate Garrity. She was scheduled to be a guest at Comic-Con 2020, yeah. special guest after 20 years in the trenches as a web cartoonist. You got invited to be a uh, special guest at Comic-Con and then... And now here we are. Yeah, then the world ended. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, pleased to be here today and pleased to have gotten the assignment. Well, thank you so much for agreeing <laughs> to interview me. It was my, it was my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, celebrating 20 years as a web cartoonist. Uh, so this is your first home comic. Yeah, that is Narbonic. I started that in 2000. Um, basically, I drew comics in high school and in college and around the end of college, uh, I could discovered like web comics. Some friends turned me on to the existence of comics on the internet and I thought, hey, I can probably do this. So um, about a month after graduating from college, I made a website and started putting strips up. And uh, Narbonic ended up going for six and a half years, I think. Um, then I took uh, about a year when I was not doing a daily strip, although I still had some weekly strips going at that point, and started my current strip, Skin Horse, which I do with writer Jeff Wells, and that is still continuing to this day. Okay, and, and uh, Comic-Con, asked us not to use copyrighted music. Otherwise, I would queue up some Smash Mouth here and take everybody back to the year 2000. <laughs> 2000 when you <laughs> were uh, getting into web comics. And there was, was there a web comics scene? Was there anything? Were you just putting this out there? What was... Yeah, there was a web comics. There were definitely people who were doing comics online before I was um, going way back to the 90s, even the early 90s. Um, but it was relatively small at the time and there were a lot of people doing sort of like four panel newspaper style strips, which is what I did with Nirvonic and actually what I'm still doing with Skin Horse. Um, one of the things I liked about the idea of doing web comics is that I'd read like long running web comics, well now long running web comics like, like Sluggy Freelance or like um, David Willis's comics, and uh, they were daily strips, but they had an ongoing storyline. And I'd always liked uh, comic strips like Popeye that had um, that were humor strips, but had like plot lines that were going on, and uh, you could follow the story from day to day. And that wasn't something you could really do in the newspaper anymore because newspaper readers weren't really following the strips carefully enough to just keep keep up on what like little orphan Annie was doing every day for months on end. But with web comics, you could just click back through and read the archives. So I thought this is an exciting way to do like my own Popeye. <laughs> so in summer of 2000, how do you, how do you launch a web comic? Uh, pretty simply. I um, graduated from college. I moved out to um, San Francisco because I got an internship at the Cartoon Art Museum where I um, eventually met my, my, my later husband who um, was also a volunteer there. Uh, I had an internship at the Cartoon Art Museum and I got work at uh, Viz Media to basically support me through the internship because I didn't pay. And meanwhile, I was living in this family spare room and had a computer. I it got all, it. it all sounds so glamorous. Yo, it was living the high life. I was living in somebody's spare room and then eventually got moved down to like the closet when they got another set of renters. It was it was a difficult situation. But um, I had a computer and I had an internet connection and um, I had the notepad function for writing my HTML on and I had M MS Paint for editing my comics. <laughs> and that was how I did it. I just 
started drawing comics and scanning them and sticking them on the internet. Okay, and how did you how did you build an audience? I emailed about a dozen of my friends, and I told my Usenet news group that I was on. It was a Mystery mm -hmm. Science Theater Usenet group, and I actually I still am friends with people who are on there, and I still I know I still have readers who like I contacted through the Usenet group. And actually that was it. It was kind of um, an experiment on my part to see if I could like, how far I could snowball this if I just like told a few dozen people and like, you know, to see how far that would move through um, what was then a much smaller internet. Okay, and we haven't actually talked about what the comic is. So let's show that again and tell us what we're seeing here. Tell Thanks, us this is, <laughs> yes, this is, volume one of the two volume omnibus edition, which I'm very proud of. Uh, Narbonic is a daily comic strip about um, a mad scientist laboratory. Uh, Helen Narbonne is an up and coming or at least ambitious um, young mad scientist and she has a small staff. She's got a tech guy named Dave and she's got an intern named Mel and um, she's got a super intelligent gerbil named Artie and they uh, they all live in the lab together and do super science and that's about it but it does have a very uh, it does have a, an ongoing overarching plot that eventually builds and uh, resolves very satisfyingly if I do say so myself <laughs> yeah so over the course of six and a half years yeah. you told this the story and did you have did you have this whole overall story in mind from the very beginning or did this no, develop as you went? but I had a lot of it planned out I had a rough idea of where I wanted things to go things changed a lot over time if you go to narbonic.com where the archives are still online I have like a regular version of the archives and then an annotated one where I have notes under each strip which I did I did a narbonic rerun after the strip ended and um, in that, I go into detail about some of the plot lines that changed. I don't want to go into like too much here because there are like crazy spoilers for this like 20 year old webcomic. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, some things were very much planned out. Some things I had a general idea and it was, I sort of had to gradually work my way to where I wanted it to be. Um, I remember getting very excited when I figured out exactly where I wanted the ending to go and I had like very hyper enthusiastic notes and around my doodles, which I don't usually do at all. Mostly I don't really have notes, I just have a lot of doodles and sometimes lists of things that need to happen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So from the technical standpoint, one of the things that I've always thought was really cool is rather than type out an outline or uh, a script, you just you just sketch this out in notebooks. Uh, yeah, I just do thumbnails and notebook paper. I draw, all, do all like nearly all of my sketching and thumbnailing on like just regular line notebook paper because it feels intimidating to use like a professional sketch pad. So um, my yeah, the the outlines for Narbonic and now for Skin Horse are basically just folders filled with like notebook paper with thumbnails written on them and in Narbonic I'd write them all out of order and then sort of slot them into place to get them into chronological order over the years. Mm -hmm. I do that a little bit with the Skin Horse but uh, my co-writer Jeff does a lot of the plotting for Skin Horse now so a lot of that is in his hands and I don't really do as much of the like plotting a strip five years in advance like I did in Narbonic. I've got a few. There's a few sometimes <laughs> a, like a particular plot element will interest me and I'll like do future strips for Mr. Parrot but a lot of that Jeff plots out now. Okay, we'll get to Skin Horse in a minute. But, yeah. Um, again, just to technology has changed so much in the last twenty years, and what's interesting to me is Narbonic was almost um, cut short because it was it was successful enough that you were getting a big audience, but it was not successful enough to generate. Uh, ad revenue or anything so you're yeah. the bandwidth that we're talking about probably everybody's cell phone has this much now but at the time you were getting because you're getting um you're going up from dozens of readers to hundreds of readers to approaching the thousands of readers and yeah, this was this was thousands gonna, of readers easily yeah but this was 
this was this was threatening to shut down your whole yeah. operation. Um, the, the, the particular technical problems may have changed, but the basic problem of trying to monetize content is still an issue on the internet. It's hard to make a living on web comics or on really web anything. So yeah, I had, um, when Narvonic started to get more popular, it started to cost me money <laughs> rather than making me money. And so I went to, a, I ended up moving on to a, um, what was the new uh, subscription site called Modern Tales. Uh, was run by a guy named Joey Manley, who was wonderful. And he was just really interested in building web comics as a, you know, important part of the comics world as art and hopefully as business. And so it was a it was a subscription based web comic site where you paid a monthly subscription and got access to all the comics on there. And Narbonic did very well there because it was a daily comic and people would come in every day to read it, which helped bring my numbers up. So I was, I always did well on Modern Tales and I was very happy there. I ended up doing other comics for like the various Modern Tales spinoff sites that Joey eventually started. Um, there, were, there were several of them. There was um, Girlomatic, which was initially run by Leah Hernandez and was sort of more of the lady oriented comic site. And I did a comic called Little Mel for that one, which I actually continued doing for a while. Um, I still have those up online if I made my own little mini site for the Little Mel archives. Um, I did a comic for Serializer, which was like their, their sort of indie webcomic site. Um, that was um, a comic called um, Trunk Town, which I did with the great, great, great indie cartoonist Tom Hart. I was very, very excited to work with him because I've been like a fan of his since the 90s when his comics were recommended in the Palmer's Picks column of Wizard Magazine, so I went out and bought them. Um, and uh, I did a comic for um, their action, the action web comic subscription site, which was initially called Graphic Smash. Wait, no, it, it was, I forget what the original title was, but then it was Graphic Smash, and I did a comic called, um, Currently called Smithson. It had a different name. It was initially more fun and then Smithson. And um, I had several really great artists on that. And for most of the run, it was um, Lynn Moore, who's really very cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, anyway, that was my run on the Modern Tales family. It was kind of a big part of that in like the mid 2000s. So Modern Tales, I mean, it, it, it saved you because you were, you were in danger of losing a couple hundred dollars a month for the privilege of having a webcomic to. Instead of. Maybe, gaining make, enough money make, for a sandwich yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm not good at making money i think jason shiga said that there was enough for a nice enough sandwich. for a sandwich nice yeah sandwich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there was like it was just um there were a lot of different web comics collectives and portals and group sites at the time it's something i'm kind of surprised isn't around anymore i guess it's very hard to do anything that isn't centered around one of the big social media sites, but um, I always liked having a play, places where you could go and read just lots of comics and discover more and like just go linking around all over the internet. Fortunately, um, it's more um, profitable to keep people on your one site. So like all the social media sites are kind of designed to keep you there and keep you from jumping around the different websites is less fun but it's the nature of the beast yeah <laughs> but uh yeah going back to the web comics community mm -hmm. um so early early 2000s it felt like um yeah you could actually get the whole web comics community together without violating social distancing yeah i think um, 2001 was the first time we went to comic-con is that right mm -hmm. and um there was like a lot of people there from Modern Tales and we all got together for the first time and like I think 2002 was the big was that the big Modern that Tales? That was the yeah. big gathering. Oh, yeah. That was so fun and then like Keen Spot which is one of the other big collectives also had lots of people meet up at that time and get to meet each other and interact it was really cool also all the members of Pants Press who were a group of like mostly teenage girls who all met together online got to meet and that was it was really fun to watch them to get together and everyone in that group kind of went on to be kind of a big deal. <laughs> Jen Wang was in that, in there and Vera Broskull and Erica Moen and Dylan McConus and Bill Mudrin. They're all amazing. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I mean, 
it's not like every single web comics person could like get together in the same comic con room but pretty darn close actually it was one of the big rooms that <laughs> big halls they could yeah yeah <laughs> but uh yeah so you did narbonic you mm -hmm. you've um yeah, and you actually eventually ascended to the role of editor. Yeah, of I Modern took over Tales. editing Modern Tales in its in its final years, which was it was really exciting. It was fun. Um, it was unfortunate at the time that like the subscription model was starting to go under for the first time. It's kind of back in other media now, um, so the site was kind of um, it was losing subscription money, and we ended up switching to being a pay site. Uh, not a free site. Sorry, opposite of a pay site. We ended up switching to being a free site. So I sort of oversaw that and um we ran we ended up we running ran like online graphic novels and longer form comics we had a thing called modern tales long play which was always really fun to do because i liked being able to offer longer works online in addition to the sort of serialized comics that for example i did and a lot of really great creators were on there there were a lot of amazing creators in modern tales in general uh, by the way like i mean gene yang's american born chinese started out on modern tales um, Raina Telgemeier's Smile started on, I think, girl uh, There was just a lot of amazing, there's a lot of amazing work. Like the level of art was, and imagination was really high. It was a good time. <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously nostalgic for it, and I love Joey Manley. He was a really very kind and very inspiring man who was not a cartoonist himself. He just really loved comics. Yeah, and he started out with, uh, he had a, you know, sort of a proto-podcast called yeah. Talk About Comics. Yeah, so that was how he recruited people. He was like, he was an interesting character. He was like a sort of a wunderkind writer who had like a, you know, very critically acclaimed first novel. Um, and then sort of wandered and ended up becoming a tech guy and made a little bit of money in the... East Bay tech world and that was how he ended up starting Modern Tales and um, some other stuff projects and yeah initially before Modern Tales they had a podcast what would now be a podcast I guess um, talk about comics where he interviewed different comics people and it was a secret recruitment plan mm -hmm. finding people for, for Modern Tales ah that was fun good times yeah uh, and I mentioned I mentioned editing Modern Tales mm -hmm. but also you know, to survive as a cartoonist, a yeah. lot of people wear a lot of different hats. And yeah. you've actually, um, for more than 15 years, you've been editing manga for Viz yeah. Media. I'm a freelance manga editor for Viz Media, and I've worked on a number of, of great manga titles, including over the years, I briefly did Naruto, Yu Yu Hakusho, and um, One Piece when they started in Shonen Jump magazine. Um, I've been doing Case Closed, aka Detective Conan, for an incredibly long time. I think I started around volume 18 or 19, and I'm now on volume 76. <laughs> yes, this is an extremely long-running title in Japan. Um, yeah, right now I'm doing just uh, Case Closed, Hayati the Combat Butler, and the new series by the author of Hayati the Combat Butler, which is called Fly Me to the Moon. But I've done a lot of other titles over the years, and I'm a big manga nut. Yeah, and does that do you go way back with manga? With manga, it started in college. Like probably a lot of like manga and anime nerds of my generation, uh, because we didn't have that stuff on TV and in bookstores at the time. Uh, it actually kind of started when I took. I was oddly obsessed with like other aspects of Japanese culture and took a class on like. Japanese culture in college and the instructor was um, the professor was this Japanese woman who was into manga and she did a unit on manga where we learned about it and I thought that was super cool <laughs> so then I joined the um, I took a, a student taught course in anime and manga um, because I went to um, at Vassar where I went to college um, they had a program where students could teach courses for no credit it was just for fun um and some of the courses were were useful like um, there's a bartending course you had to take to become a bartender <laughs> at the student center things like that people would teach like archery and other like athletic skills they had but then there were ones like the anime and manga class which is basically just an excuse to sit around and watch anime and manga which was exactly what happened and then i just became a 
take over the wheel built for a while. And you, of course, taught one of those classes. I taught, I know, I know, because I taught a, I taught like a four, I taught like a four credit student course at college. Yes, I did teach a course. I was one of the people, I sort of team taught a course on comics in my senior year of college. This was a more formal course. We had like a professor advisor and people were actually hopefully taking it to learn comics. I taught, and I taught it with um, another, one of my classmates and friends, T. Faulkner, who is now the editor at King Features Syndicate and is doing a lot of really cool stuff with comics. And we both kind of ended up, we, we remained comics nerds long after this class. Yeah, I'm sorry we don't have a big chart with pins and strings <laughs> behind us yeah. to show all these connections. T worked on some stuff with Joey Manley for a while too. Yeah. So working some long tail stuff. You got T to Joey Manley. You yep. have Joey Manley uh, working with Derek Kirkham and Gene Yang, and then that yeah. leads to first second books. And uh -huh. so I think you know comics still exists today because of <laughs> you and Joey Manley. And mostly Joey Manley. Okay. He's, yeah, he's one of the. <laughs> One of the Zadokim of, of comics. Yeah. <laughs> so six and a half years of Nirvana, mm -hmm. you, you brought it to a conclusion. Yeah. Was that, was that a hard decision to make? Well, no, because it had an ongoing story and the story came to an end. I mean, Skin Horse is the same way, except it's ending up being considerably longer. Skin Horse is over 10 years long now. It's going to be over in the next couple of years, I think. But that's still quite long. That's going to be like twice as long as Nirvana. Anyway, um, yeah, but it had our Narbonic had a plot arc, and eventually the plot arc came, the plot came to an end, and I resolved everything, and then the story was over. Yeah. I mean, I've done like follow up stories. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I was um, <laughs> I in mean, this like local cartoonist group called the Couscous Collective. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew Farago, curator of the Cartoon Art Museum, was in it too. Okay, as well as other <laughs> people. Um, actually, the um, the Narbonic and Skin Horse books are now sort of published to the Couscous Collective. Uh, that's our my that's our imprint. Um, but we used to do annual themed anthologies, and I'd always do either a Narbonic short story or a Skin Horse short story for those. So I actually had a little have a little backlog of other Narbonic side stories. If there are any Narbonic fans that haven't seen them, want to check them out. Great. So after six and a half years of doing daily comics, yeah, you said never again, and that lasted all of. It lasted a year. year. <laughs> I didn't say, I said, well, what I told myself, I would never do a daily strip again unless I had somebody to help me out with it because it's just an enormous amount of work to do a daily strip. Um, so yeah, I had a year that I didn't, I had, I had weekly comics I was doing. I was still doing Little Mel and um, Smithson at that time. But um, I did have more free time, which is why I edited about 12 different manga during that time <laughs> simultaneously. Um, but then when I got done, but then like after that year, I had an idea for another comic that is set in the Narbonic universe. And then I, that was how I came to do Skin and Horse. And Skin look, Horse. that's the first volume and also the most recent volume, number eight. The and it was volume. fun as a, as a reader when... Like we, we were getting hints that this might be in the same universe. Right? Yeah, and well, were... I hate to spoil things, but yes, I do eventually, yeah, skin, it is eventually confirmed that Skin Horse and Narbonic are set in the same reality. <laughs> Narbonic is about mad scientists, and Skin Horse is about people who have to clean up after the That's mad scientists. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Skin Horse is about the people who have to clean up after the mad scientists and Narbonic. It's about a government organization that is in black ops social services they try to help um zombies and beast men and robots and other um creations of super science and your co-writer actually does this kind of work yes my co-writer <laughs> jeff wells is a great writer who i initially met because he liked narbonic and um oh, actually i need to backtrack what to narbonic and yeah. talk about this is this is gonna sound crazy, but where you actually met I like Jeffrey that Wells you, like, in person? You switched out the graphic here. This is very professional. Know, this, <laughs> this is very cool. I, I'm I'm nothing if not professional. Yeah. But the story of where you met Jeff Wells the in person. The normal place that you meet people. Which is. Which is at the the mini convention called Narbonicon that used to be held in honor of Narbonic every year in Minnesota. Narbonicon. Narbonicon. It was were... super fun. It was like twelve people. And they'd have a, like a mini convention and they'd fly me out and we'd like chill. We had good times. We, we, <laughs> <laughs> what? We went to, the, we had, went to a talk by the Museum of Questionable Medical Devices. 
One year we went to the zoo. One year we went to the electricity museum. It was really awesome, and I miss it, and I miss the Twin Cities. And we saw Al Franken. One time we saw Al <laughs> Franken at Hell's Kitchen. Yes. So if you're in the if you're in the Twin Cities, if they're reopened, um, yeah, it's one of those. As far as I know, they're still closed right now. I could be yeah. Wrong. But uh, it's always subject to change. Anyway, so you met Jeff Wells. You hit it off. Well, we you know we talked online and we met in person at the Narboticons, and yeah, I ended up like just chatting with him online for a long time. And he also he also wrote the longest Narbonic fanfic. He wrote an incredibly long in human history. He wrote an incredibly long Narbonic fanfic. Well, there's there's only like five Narbonic fanfics, but he wrote the longest one. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so he I liked his writing. I always wanted to sort of work with him on something, and he actually is like um, you know an underappreciated government bureaucrat in uh, Wisconsin. So. You know, I asked if he wanted to work with me on this, and he said yes. He probably didn't realize that it would be over 10 years of his life, for which I apologize. <laughs> Sorry, I also, Jeff. <laughs> I also apologize to Pancha Diaz, who colors all the strips and is stuck just coloring skin horse strips until Jeff and I stop writing them. And what's, do you have any favorite notes that Pancha writes as she's coloring these these strips does she no she's very kind about it she just asked me what color people are and and monsters and things you know um, she's done have we seen this character before actually uh, yes i have to go through the arc well there's a lot of characters at this point it's been going on for a while um ponchi doesn't want to miscolor people or you know screw things up uh she's done some great stuff about the storyline that we're doing right now it's actually just wrapping up is set um in key West, in um the Florida Keys, and I really like the sort of um, sort of pastel Florida color scheme that Poncha always does for those scenes. Like I, everybody looks very, everybody looks very cool and breezy <laughs> when she colors them. <sighs> Poncha's great. Yeah, so yeah, that's, I met Jeff at the Narbonic Convention, and then we worked together in Skin Horse. Yeah, and that's great. where I am now. Perfectly. <laughs> perfectly normal yeah so as a cartoonist uh you, you've participated in um a number of again car- most cartoonists do a lot of different projects and yeah, do. one of my favorites that you did was well, thank you. uh in this book this is peanuts a tribute to charles schultz this was like an incredible honor to do and yes this is a book that, that they got different cartoonists to do Comic strips inspired by Peanuts. The unofficial title, uh, according to Lex Fajardo, <laughs> uh, the editor, was, yeah. was the, the off-model Peanuts project. It is. It's all off-model Peanuts, which is great. Getting to draw off-model Peanuts characters is, is just one of life's great joys. But yeah, um, my story is called The Telling of Faults, and it's um, sort of a Lucy and Peppermint Patty story and is based on a true story about my mother's childhood. Um, she is the Lucy character. That's probably all I should say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on the time that she lined up all the other kids in, in the neighborhood and because she was mad and told them she was going to tell them all her, their faults. And they did it. They all lined up and let her tell them their faults. <laughs> and anyone who meets your mother will not be surprised. It, it kind of, this story explains this. everything about why I, I am this way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. And one of your other interests is science fiction. I have been writing. And you are a yes. member in good standing of the Science Fiction Writers of America. Yeah, I've been writing prose. I've been publishing prose science fiction for, geez, probably about ten years now. And you flex some different muscles doing this. Than it's it's um it takes a lot less time than doing comics. It's which is kind of you great. You're featured in this book. Yes, I did a post-apocalyptic story called uh, Francisco Montoya's Almanac of Things That Can Kill You, which appears in Wastelands, the new apocalypse. But yeah, I've written, I've published about like two dozen stories now, I think, something like that. I'm trying to put together an ebook anthology of um, some of the, of some of them, some of the best ones. I'll hopefully have that out soonish. Maybe it'll even be out by the time. By the time this video airs. Yeah, probably not, but (laughs) I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> that's our cat coming in from yeah our cat is sitting next to the computer off panel yeah. um, great and coming up you were again until the entire world and yeah. publishing industry got derailed mm-hmm. you had a 
graphic novel that was due to come out this year. It's going to be coming out next yeah. year. But tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's coming out next year on account of like um, civilization collapsing. But um, yeah, I'm doing a graphic novel. Um, actually, have done a graphic novel. It's just about done, finished now, with uh, Chris Baldwin, who is another web comics long runner. He has actually been in web comics longer than I have, which is at this point that's something of a achievement. Again, summer of 2000 was your, was your yeah and he was summer. doing he was already doing a strip bruno at that point he'd been doing that for several years he did a comic called bruno he's also done one he did little d and space trawler which um, is running now but this is going to be a graphic novel and it's called um, willow wheat manor it is the story of a teenage girl who is really into classic gothic romances and literature and um, you know Wuthering Heights type stuff and she's transported to a world that seems to be like straight out of a gothic novel but things are not as they seem. It was um, Chris's concept and like he kind of brought me on to like sort of write a script and develop the ideas and everything and he's doing the art and it's really cool. And you've known Chris for a while and you've been talking yeah. about possibly collaborating. Yeah, we've, been, and... we've been looking around for a project to do together, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, um, you know, I feel like that's one of the things that, um, you know, we've all missed the most these last few months is these um, conventions and just even, yeah. even, even the little get togethers with um, artists and friends and. Yeah. I would see Chris at the um, uh, web comics convention in the DC area every year and it was good to meet up with him then. It was very exciting when I met the first time because I've been following his stuff since like before I started doing my own web comics. I don't know if he knows I was totally starstruck by him. <laughs> but it was very cool and it's very cool to be working on a title and a book with him. Yeah. And uh, and you've got another um you got other things in the works but those yes. are probably too early to um they might be imagine. um i can say that i have another web another graphic novel after willow wheat manor and i probably can't say anything more about the details on that okay and let's check our time here <laughs> see if this were actual comic-con somebody would come in with a sign to let you know that we were going over time when did we start <laughs> 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 we might have to edit You're this. You're a terrible moderator. We might have to start. We, we, we've got we've got ten more minutes. You go to moderator jail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. We got the cat is here. And yeah. You spent all this time adjusting your hair before this and like kind of getting the right seat going and now and we're here. Delete, we don't know what time it is. Have to lean forward and our our and we don't clock, know what time it is. I know. Away on the, on the I know. On the screen. I know. We picked this great seat where you can see like our, our artwork on the walls. It looks incredibly classy. Yeah. Yeah. But we've got, we've got 10 minutes, which right now would be turned over to audience questions. Yeah. Well, you collected some questions from like um, Facebook and Twitter from people. Were they, were most, they were mostly sarcastic. <laughs> they, yeah. They were, Why do you have so many sarcastic followers? They were, most of the audience questions suggested were, uh about me they which, were uh, yeah there were lots of questions about what it's like to live with such a handsome man which is all it's obviously great yeah like i, I don't <laughs> know how much detail i'm good to it's obviously awesome like you know being quarantined with, the, with like this handsome fellow and the cat is giving giving yeah. me a very sarcastic look right now well we can talk about how we met yeah okay <laughs> in addition in addition to being like important comics professionals, we are we are There's also a spoiler, we are we are actually married. Yeah, thank you, wife. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> but we actually met uh, at the Cartoon Art Museum, yeah, which yeah. I mentioned. As uh, I said earlier, I had, mentioned a few times. Yeah, ago. I had an internship there in two thousand and then Andrew started working as a volunteer <laughs> around the time my internship ended, actually. Yeah, so we're August uh, 2020 will be 20 years since we first met. That's very exciting. Yeah. I know. And uh, this this never sounds true, but you know I'm gonna I'm gonna say it on video. Yeah, you should. Um, you should. So I was I was living in San Francisco. I was looking for something to do with my weekends, mm -hmm. and I went on Craigslist. I think that's still a thing, but I went on Craigslist looking for volunteer opportunities. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. And uh, um 
it's a cartoon art museum needs volunteers and mm -hmm. I said that's that's it that's the place I'm going uh went there met um uh I think her title was bookstore manager but Hallie Brignall was the, yeah was working there um she gave me the grand tour mm -hmm. we saw the incredible peanuts 50th anniversary exhibition yeah that was up then that was very cool and you know i obviously fell in love with the place and mm -hmm. then uh she said oh, let me show you the back office before mm -hmm. you go yeah. and took me to the back office and uh she these are seriously the first words i heard when i saw you but she said oh this this is shane and she's single uh-huh yeah i think i'd probably be complaining about being single yeah yeah so that was you know that's that's a that's one of those all-time great introductions it doesn't sound, <laughs> it doesn't sound true this is shane and she's single and little did i know at the time well i'll fix that <laughs> <laughs> well i thought that you didn't actually know anything about comics because you didn't comment on my super cool bone t-shirt she was wearing a really cool yeah, was, bone t-shirt yeah it was and... really stylish i figured that you were one of like the academy of art students that came over to like do internships but didn't actually like comics very much and i showed you <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah so we started um yeah, about six months after that we started dating yeah. and never looked back mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah so I've, I've actually had a ringside seat for most of these yeah, Bonnet like I, I initially hit on you by giving you the URL for Narbonic. And I was I was impressed because because you've never met anybody on a website before. You know, the the internet you have to understand in two thousand, as far as I knew, was mm -hmm. Google and used Google to look up Narbonic, which mm -hmm. was like the only other thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only other thing. That's the only other there website could, there the only thing yeah. you could look up. Yeah. That's there the might have website. there might have been there might have been a GeoCities thing or something. This was pre pre Friendster. <laughs> uh, might have been pre Napster. It was pre MySpace. Around so Napster more. time, yeah. Um, so I was I was incredibly impressed. I was uh -huh. I was I was impressed that like you drew something. You did. You scanned it. I. You had the you had the. I'm still impressed that I could do these things. It's very impressive. You were obviously some sort of genius computer yeah. scientist to be able to yeah. have a, an internet connection where you can, yeah. you can put this comic on, on the computer. And, um, that was a little true though. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and again, uh, this is another fun thing about early 2000s technology uh -huh. is um, there might, I don't know if there was a way yet, but you had to, you had to actually manually post yes, every comic yes, every single day. Yes, because I just had this really basic HTML website. I had no like there was no auto update for the comic. And this sounds like a million years ago. It to was who one of the big was online. Today. One of my big reasons for moving to Modern Tales was they had like a whole like um, setup where you could like auto uh, you could like auto update and like put up stuff in advance. And I was very good at working in advance. Arvonic used to be like about a, at least a month in advance all the time. I'm, I've I'm only a week advance at a time in Skin Horse because Jeff and I take extra time to do stuff together. But yeah, that was exciting. <laughs> and now, you know, now I've got like one of your, your big fancy WordPress sites, like, you know, like, in, like, a, like a smart person and I can, yeah, update things in advance. But uh, at the time I just had, yeah, an extremely basic HTML site, which again, I wrote on. It was almost like Cinderella having to get home <laughs> before. <laughs> midnight because yeah, that, you had to get home you had to update yeah it put, and... it put a crimp on my love life <laughs> i'm sorry but uh you know we, we're glad thank you joey manley uh -huh. <laughs> thank you joey manley for <laughs> <laughs> auto updates <laughs> so, so that so, so i could spend, spend so, the night with you yeah so she uh -huh. could stay out after midnight yeah that was pretty important yeah um that was, that was a big improvement in my life what are, what are what are some of the other technological changes you've seen just since since two th it sounds like a million years ago i right? wish i had good ones but honestly my i feel like my tech skills are extremely rudimentary um i could i can make a wordpress site now so now my comics are on a wordpress site which initially t fagner made for me actually on the previous version of the site um she built for me um 
I'm perfectly happy just drawing my comics on paper and scanning them and uploading them. Like we have- Draw them on paper, white out. Yeah, paper. we only just, we just- hand, hand lettering, which almost- Yeah, I hand letter stuff like a fool. Nobody does that. I just, That's... it's just like, I've tried doing artificial letter, like I've tried doing fonts and I've tried making fonts of my handwriting and it always just looks a little too artificial. I feel like my artwork is sort of, I feel like it has a hand, like a really, scribbly hand drawn quality that does not look right with a typed font no matter how like scribbly i try to make the font so i always like hand letter but yeah i'm i'm actually a pretty low tech web cartoonist all things considered obviously i like edit the strips on on the computer and do photoshop to fix them up and everything and punch it colors in in uh, on photoshop but most of the actual production of the comics is extremely analog we actually just got a tablet and I still haven't learned how to use it. Do you ever see yourself making that switch? It or? seems like it would be cool. And I, like, I look at the effects that other people can get with tablets and I'm just totally amazed because there's, there's some really, really cool stuff you can do with just, you know, the entirely virtual artwork. But on the other hand, I have a lot of other art skills that I'm lacking in and digital art is just one of many. I actually have like, I don't really have any formal art training. I'm just, it's just all, all of my art is based on doodling. Um, I didn't really take any art classes in college and um, I've never learned how to do things like paint. So basically all I can do is draw comics on paper. <laughs> Great. And uh, I'll also mention um, you're uh, in addition to the, San the Science Fiction Writers of America, mm -hmm. you're also a member of the National, National Cartoonist Cartoon Society. Society. Yeah. It's always, always good to give them a shout out. Yeah. I'm and officially a cartoonist and officially a science fiction writer. It's it's pretty awesome. Two and one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And uh, yeah, and that's those are some those are some traditionalists too, for the most part. Those yeah, like the new that's the National Cartoonist Society is predominantly newspaper cartoonists. Those are those are a lot of old school artists, which I appreciate. Hand letterers. I like I, I like feeling with the young thing in a gathering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, and yeah, any any parting words for our Comic Con? Well, I'm audience? really excited to do this panel. I mean, it's um, I was I was so sad when um, you know um, the pandemic destroying all of human civilization got in the way of my personal opportunity to be a Comic Con guest. So um, being able to do a panel, you know, remotely like this is is really great, and I'm. Um, I'm glad to be interviewed by somebody who like um, is, is is extremely well versed in my entire career. But I know that you do you'd be equally well versed in if you're any other cartoonist because you're kind of the guy who knows everything about comic. That's your actual job. Yeah, I had to do. I did a panel discussion with. Uh, I did a spotlight on Judd Winnick for WonderCon years ago, and remember. Mm -hmm. You didn't see me for about six months because I just I just lived you moved in, in with his, I went in his yeah. guest room because I wanted to get those questions. Yeah. Right on. And, and you found out what happens when cartoonists stop being polite. Start getting rude. It's so true. I know. It's so true. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, we're filming this. We're wrapping this up um, around one in the morning, so you can tell. We're, yeah, because we're we. A little... <laughs> because we have to record this at night because we have a five-year-old and one of us has to be on hand to uh, keep him out of range at all times. So if both of us are doing the panel, then we're shot. We have to wait for him to actually be unconscious. We managed to get this in on the forty-five-minute window in which he's actually asleep, and before he comes out and asks going on out there yeah because he stays up until about midnight reading nancy comics and um then wakes up at about seven in the morning and we could have we could have predicted that about our child but uh yeah, I don't know. yeah that, I guess he, so. that he falls asleep reading nancy comics reading every nancy, night but... nancy specifically yeah yeah <laughs> it's uh just, that's I, a fun thing so what's yeah. um yeah just to wrap up what are what um what are you going to miss about not being in san diego Oh my July. gosh, so many things. I love going to San Diego. Like usually when we go, we go a day early so I can go to the zoo. And uh, last year we were able to take Robin and um, actually Robin got to go to the zoo twice because my parents came up and took him too. Um, so he got to just be at the zoo nonstop. 
Um, I like taking him around town. Um, the convention itself is pretty overwhelming for a kid. Um, he liked or an adult. <laughs> yeah. Last year he liked the Lego Pavilion, and we ended up spending a lot of time playing with the Legos there. Um, eventually he'll get old enough, and he'll be able to like you know stand in line for. I don't know, name it like name like a 1980s star who'd be giving out autographs. So we can finish this gag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, name name one like. Uh, lion. 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 I don't know. That's the only celebrity I know. <laughs> He actually, he actually is just, just, our kids actually just finished watching the entire run of Super Friends. So if you met anybody who worked on Super Friends, you'd be pretty excited. We'll see if we can, we'll see if we can make that happen. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thanks. You've been, you've been a, a wonderful panelist. I'm, oh, well, I'm, thank you. I'm glad we were, I'm glad we were able to uh, break quarantine together. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, thank you for, interviewing me it's um, really exciting to talk to you and like see you face to face like this i'm sorry i get a little flustered when i'm being interviewed by a very handsome man but it's it's a delight <laughs> and if uh yeah if anybody's still watching <laughs> at this point thank you very much stay tuned yep. there are so many more great comic-con at home panels coming up um again my name's andrew Paragra. it's been my Pleasure to interview Shane and Kate Garrity for her spotlight panel. And it's been my pleasure to be interviewed. Thanks. And best wishes. We miss all of you. Have a happy and healthy uh, 2020 and beyond. We'll see you uh, at San Diego Comic Con in 2021. I hope so. Oh, thanks. Thank Good you night. so much. <laughs>